So um, this session is just to kind of get everybody on the same page with the same um, uh, terminology and uh, so that when we um, head off into the other talks uh, today that um, everybody will have heard the terms that we're using and uh, we know everybody's on kind of the same foundation. And so for many of you, this will be a review, maybe even back from your college days. And um, but for others of you, this uh, will be new information and we'll have a break kind of in the middle to let you stretch and run to the restroom and all of that. Um, and please um, ask questions in the chat box on the side. Emma will pop in um, and uh, uh, give me a cue to answer them because I can't see them right now on my screen. But i um, happy to answer any questions that you have. So in terms of our um, terminology, we are going to talk uh, about weather. I'm sorry, we're going to talk about climate um as opposed to weather and just to make sure that everybody um, uh, has a good idea of the difference we talk about weather as being um, the state of the atmosphere so what's happening now or what happened um, over a particular place at a particular time so for example a line of thunderstorms came through last night finally gave us some rain uh, which we were pretty excited about, uh, but uh, that event was a weather event. Now that event will go into the statistics that will uh, form our climate here in Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, so we do get rain events in August. It'll be another rain event in the rain events that we've seen um, in a historical period during August. Um, but our climate that we'll be talking about is pretty long term. So no one weather event um, signals climate change, but the culmination and the aggregation of all of these weather events is what's going to signal the climate change. Um, there's a phrase that people uh, have used, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get, uh, and with climate change we might have to change that a little bit because in many cases uh, we aren't getting what we expect in our climate system. All right, so our first quiz for you all. I won't be grading anybody because I don't see who says what. Um, but if Emma will start the um, Zoom poll, then um, we want you to um, uh, choose which of these examples is not climate. So if you haven't done a Zoom poll before, you should see the question in a little pop-up box um, in addition to the question on my slide. And then you just select uh, which one that you um, uh, think is the case and click on that. And then um, we will show the results of the poll after you read through those. Okay, so we'll end the poll and what we see is that everybody chose the right answer. Hooray for us. So the um, uh, high, uh, highest wind gust on a specific date in a specific place is just a marker of that particular event. 
but you'll notice the other things um, provide us some context for a, either a particular day at a particular place or um, at a place over um, a certain period of time. You see that all of the other ones are in comparison to things that have happened um, already. So climate essentially gives you the context um, to which you're uh, used to or you you want to become used to if you, for example, move to a place. So if I move to a place, I might want to know what I should wear today so that if it's too hot or too cold, I'm dressing appropriately. But if I move to a place, I need to buy a wardrobe that's suited for the climate. All right, so um, one of the challenges of uh, climate change is uh, somewhat similar to the challenge of our uh, coronavirus situation in that um, there's not a specific cause and effect. Now, a number of um, uh, medical doctors will say, you know, the cause is the coronavirus and the effect is somebody um, getting the virus. But when we see the impacts of that virus, on people, we're seeing different manifestations of it. So some people don't have any symptoms. So some and some people um, uh, are affected in the respiratory system. Some people are affected in their heart. Uh, some people are at the hospital. Um, and unfortunately, some people die. And so the impacts of climate change are somewhat similar. There are some places in the world we see very little effect. There are some places where it's really dramatic and everything in between. And the reason for that is because our climate system is really quite complicated. Um, so even those who study meteorology normally just study the atmosphere, but when you study climatology, you have to uh, study even broader than that, including our ocean system, uh, what we call our cryosphere, where all of our um, ice and snow resides, uh, the topography, the land cover um, type and how it changes over time. So all of these things contribute to um, uh, energy in the system and to moisture in the system and those influence uh, movement of, of air um, that influences temperatures in different areas of the atmosphere. And so that's why it's pretty complicated. So these are some of the major components that uh, we talk about and focus on when we're uh, thinking about our climate system. Of course, there's many others, but I teach that in a whole course. And now I have to compress that to five minutes for you. So um, these are the ones that I am going to uh, focus on. And it all starts with the sunlight that's entering our, our, our Earth system and where that sunlight is absorbed. And then that energy is re-radiated um, to try to get our, um, our atmosphere in uh, radiative balance with the incoming um, sun. So, so the amount of energy that comes in from the sun um, into the top of our atmosphere, we want the same amount of energy leaving our atmosphere so that our over a long period of time, our Earth system is in balance. Um, and so one of the ways that we look at that is we look at what we call the net radiation at the surface. So this is just like um, your bank account. Uh, so you have things that are coming into your bank account and things that are leaving your bank account. And at the end of the month, you want it to balance. Um, and so our net radiation is similar. 
course, you probably want more money going in than out. In this case, we want everything to balance to zero. But uh, so we have incoming solar radiation, which is at a short wavelength. So the wavelength of the radiation is really important. Um, so uh, solar uh, radiation is in the visible and the ultraviolet um, wavelengths primarily. And the, when it's absorbed at the surface and then the earth releases that energy back into the atmosphere, it releases it in the thermal infrared. Okay, so that's a different wavelength than the incoming solar radiation and you'll see later why that's important. So we add the incoming, so we actually get incoming thermal radiation from our atmosphere because our atmosphere has a temperature. It's not freaking cold, it's, it's you know warm for the most part, so it's releasing energy. And uh, so we get incoming uh, radiation from the sun, we get incoming radiation from our atmosphere, um, from the clouds in our atmosphere and the other gases. And then we get outgoing radiation um, from reflection of the sun's energy on a surface. And um, we refer to that as albedo, so that reflection of the solar energy. And then, um, and then the Earth's surface itself releases uh, thermal infrared radiation. So you add the two coming in and subtract the two going out, and you get the net amount of radiation. So that's my long-winded view of uh, this simple diagram, which shows that we get an excess or surplus of radiation near the equator, and we have a deficit at the poles. And horizontally, our, um, uh, that's, uh, that's not in balance. And so most things in physics want to get in balance. And so much of uh, what drives our atmosphere and our ocean system is trying to move that excess energy from the equator toward the poles. And that gets us our movement of our um, uh, uh, atmospheric systems. So that's our, that's our initial driver of everything that happens in the atmosphere. So I mentioned this term albedo. So the albedo is just uh, the reflection of the solar radiation. So over all of the Earth, we reflect on average about a third of the incoming radiation, but that's distributed um, ov uh, over the uh, land and ocean surface in different ways. And it turns out that things that are very light in color, like snow or um, or sand, really light colored sand, uh, those things are highly reflective, and so the albedo is going to be high. So we see the highest albedos um, here in the Sahara and Arabian deserts, and then also in these far northern latitudes where we get a lot of snow and ice. Um, forests, especially like um, spruce or pine or some of these dark evergreen forests uh, don't reflect as much of the sun's energy. So they, um, they absorb more of it. And so we see some of these darker colors in the green to be around where the major forests are of the world. And then where we have kind of open prairies, we see kind of a, a mix between, um, between the two. And so the, that difference in albedo is going to provide us some regional differences in how climate change affects us. And we'll see that a little bit later. Now, key for um, anthropogenic or even natural climate change is what are the gases that are in our atmosphere? Um, and so we have. Um, predominantly nitrogen and oxygen in our atmosphere. Nitrogen takes up a lot of space um, and doesn't do a whole lot um, else in terms of what we're talking about for climate change. 
oxygen, obviously very important for humans and uh, wildlife and other things to breathe in. And then we breathe out the carbon dioxide that the vegetation systems, all the plants around the earth are breathing in. So we've got um, oxygen and carbon dioxide cycling through our atmosphere. Uh, we also have water vapor, so that's just gaseous water. So we see, we don't see that. Um, but when clouds starting to start to form, we know that it, that there was originally water vapor in the air and it condensed into a liquid to form um, the cloud. And then we have a number of these other um, gases. So uh, the two main gases, nitrogen and oxygen, take up most of the atmosphere. And then we have what we call these trace gases, uh, which are in smaller amounts. And you'll see that even carbon dioxide is only 0.036% uh, of our atmosphere. But what I remind people of is that even a small amount of a gas can be very significant in our energy system. These gases that are marked, um, hopefully you can see this in kind of this red color, water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and ozone, Altogether, we refer to those as greenhouse gases. And the greenhouse gases interact with that thermal infrared, the um, ultraviolet and the um, uh, visible radiation pass by those gases. So it just passes by like um, those gases weren't there. But, um, these gases absorb very heavily in the thermal infrared, okay? So anytime thermal infrared comes by them, they absorb, and then, the, and then anytime a molecule absorbs radiation, it's gonna gain energy, and when it gains energy, it increases in temperature, okay? So we'll talk about that um, probably after the break in some more detail, but just a reminder um, there. But again, these gases are very small in concentration. So I always say to my students who don't believe that they could have any effect in the atmosphere. So what if I offered you a glass of water because you were out working out, you rode your bike after, the, you know, for two hours, you're really thirsty because you were stupid and forgot to bring some water with you. And I say, here's this glass of water for you. It only has one drop of cyanide in it. I mean, big glass of water. Guessing that you're not gonna take a chance even though you're desperate for it. And so, um, so something that's in a very small amount can still have a very dramatic impact. And that's what our greenhouse gases um, do in our atmosphere. Okay, so um, we have most of the energy of, um, at the Earth's surface, um, concentrating at, at the equator and nearby the equator in the tropics. Uh, we have this energy deficit at the poles. That's gonna translate into our global air temperatures. Um, and so what we see is in general, the warmest temperatures are near the equator, but you also see that there are some regional impacts. And these regional impacts can be caused by um, mountains. So it's pretty clear. You can see the um, Andes mountain range down the western side of South America. Um, these regional impacts can be caused by um, land water differences. So water uh, takes more energy to warm water than it, um, than it takes to warm land. So land heats and cools very quickly, water doesn't. And so you'll see that in the summer hemisphere, which in this case is the northern hemisphere, um, this line bows upward, northward, where there's uh, land surfaces and downward where there's water because it's cooler, okay? So those temperature patterns will help us set up some pressure patterns. 
The other thing that helps set us up um, some pressure patterns at the surface is um, that if you take a, an atmosphere on any planet um, and you, you spin that planet around its axis, then um, you're going to naturally get some movement of that air that's vertical in nature. It creates these vertical cells. Um, and the main one that we, he, you might have heard of is the Hadley cell. The Hadley cell has rising motion at the equator and sinking motion at about uh, 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. Now, the actual location of where that um, rising and sinking motion is, is going to be dependent on the season that you're in. So it moves slightly to the north in the um, uh, northern hemisphere's summer, and it moves slightly to the south in the southern hemisphere's summer. But in general, we get rising motion at the equator, or near the equator, and sinking motion at 30 degrees north and south. And what this means is that the rising motion will lift that warm, moist air over the equator upward and make a band of huge thunderstorms and causes the winds to converge at the surface, helping to support that upward motion. And this leads to something called the Intertropical Convergence Zone, or ITCZ. You see that in a dotted um, red line here. And so this marks where those, some of the largest thunderstorms on the planet are located. Um, now it's not there all the time and it's not necessarily a solid band. Um, otherwise our planes would have trouble crossing from one hemisphere to another. There are breaks in the bands that they can go through. Um, but in general, we get a lot of rain in this area and then the ITCZ moves uh, south during the um, winter and um, and so this is where our largest rainforests of the world are. So they're not there for just some random reason. Um, it's the climate of, uh, uh, and the physics of our climate that's actually causing where our, our rainforests um, and heavy rain around the world is located. Sinking motion then is related to um, clear skies in general. So a lot of times, um, you hear on the, the weather, on, on TV, we have a big high pressure system moving in, it's gonna get hot when it's in the summertime, it'll get really cold if it's in the wintertime, but that's because clouds aren't covering the area and clouds happen to moderate the temperatures. So we get more extremes in temperatures when we have high pressure um, in, in a region typically. So high pressure is clear skies. And so we see these large high pressure systems. We call these the subtropical highs. So subtropical highs are generally over the subtropics, again, about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. And you'll notice that they're located primarily over the oceans. So we have five major subtropical ocean basins across the world. Um, we've got the uh, Northern Pacific, Northern Atlantic, Southern Pacific, Southern Atlantic, and Indian Ocean. And that's where that downward motion is the most intense. And so we get the most intense high pressure systems um, over these areas. Now, why is that important? It's important because high and low pressure systems cause the wind to blow in certain directions. So let's just look at the high pressure systems um, in preparation for the next slide. In the Northern Hemisphere, winds blow clockwise at the surface around a surface high pressure system. All right, so that means that our winds are blowing in, in this direction, which means on the western side of that high pressure system, we get winds blowing from south to north, bringing in that 
high temperature um, air to the north. And then on the eastern side of that high pressure system, we get winds blowing from north to south, bringing cold air downward. So this is our big kind of air conditioning system. We're blowing that excess energy from the equator toward the poles. We're bringing that cold air from the poles toward the equator so that we can try to get some balance. Uh, same thing here in the Atlantic. We have um, winds that are blowing clockwise around that high. In the southern hemisphere, it's just the opposite. So the winds blow counterclockwise around those high pressure systems. And so you'll see that that means, again, on the western side of the basin, uh, we're blowing from north to south. So that means we're bringing in that warm tropical air to the south. And on the eastern side of the basin, we're moving that cold air northward. And so we get um, that transfer of energy that way. So those are some of our big circulation systems. Why is that important? Because here in the south central part of the United States, what happens in terms of these major systems and then the low pressure systems that are um, typically around 65 degrees north and south, they strengthen in the winter hemisphere. So we see them in July, we see three of them here, major low pressure systems. Um, in our um, winter time, we'll get the Aleutian low right off of Alaska and we'll get the Icelandic low um, so those low pressure systems will strengthen in the winter time. How those change because of climate change will influence all of the weather, even right here in the south central part of the United States. So we have to think broadly as well as locally when we're um, planning for uh, decades into the future with respect to climate change. Uh, okay, I think that was, okay. So now remember the circulation and the location of these high pressure systems, these five main high pressure systems. And now let's look at our ocean system. Let's look at the circulation of our surface currents. And oh, by gosh, by golly, these look very much the same as what we were talking about on the last slide. And that's because that air at the surface is dragging the surface water with it. And so this um, excess of energy at the equator and the deficit at the poles is physically creating our ocean currents through these, this, this step process that we just walked through. So again, we're now dragging warm ocean water um, on the western sides of these lar larger basins, either northward in the northern hemisphere and southward in the southern hemisphere and we're dragging cold water toward the equator on the east side of these three major basins, okay? And it's more obvious in the larger basins, it's a little bit more complicated in um, the Indian Ocean basin, um, but the, the premise is still, uh, is still there. So again, that's, um, trying to uh, help our, our ocean system reach a, a energy balance by that movement. So as our air is moving around, it's dragging different types of what we call air masses. So air masses are these large bodies of air that have certain temperature and moisture characteristics. So sometimes you hear a cold front is moving through an area, well a cold front is going to bring colder air. So there's a colder air mass behind it. Um, and so our weather systems are dragging these air masses around the earth and these air masses get their characteristics um, from sitting over an area for a while 
And so if it's sitting over a continent, then we tend to refer to that as continental air mass. If it's sitting over an ocean, we call it a maritime air mass. If it is warm air from the tropics, then it's a tropical air mass. If it's cold air, then it's either a polar or an Arctic air mass. And so if we have a warm, moist air mass, then it is maritime tropical. If we have a cold, dry air mass, then it's continental polar. And so we get these um, different types of air masses and they um, will influence the climate of the region because there are some air masses, for example, we um, perhaps very, very, very um, rarely see true continental Arctic air masses in um, the southern, um, the south central region. Um, and that would probably only be once every five years or so with a really strong winter low pressure system. Um, but obviously they see them a lot in Canada. So, um, so those air masses are gonna influence our, um, our uh, climate. Then we have topography and a topography is important because as wind blows and it rises, remember we get clouds and then as it sinks, we get, um, uh, we get clear skies. So that means that the patterns in the topography on our earth are gonna be related to the patterns of precipitation because you aren't gonna have precipitation unless you have clouds. And so what we see is um, depending on the prevailing wind direction. So for example, off of the uh, far Western coast of North America, the prevailing wind direction is from west to east. So it's gonna hit those mountains, it's gonna rise. And this is where we see this band of precipitation right along the, um, uh, on the uh, western side of that mountain range. And then we see essentially desert or very dry region on the eastern side of that mountain range. So the combination of prevailing winds and topography is going to greatly affect our precipitation patterns. We also see that, as I mentioned before, where the intertropical convergence zone is, we have our highest amount of precipitation. And then where those subtropical high pressure systems were at about 30 degrees um, south and about 30 degrees north, we generally see some of our major deserts of the world. Um, so these things all combine into our precipitation. All right, so another quiz for you. This one you don't have to read quite as much. So which of these components is essentially the instigator of everything else? Or uh, uh, maybe I should say, sorry, the instigator of our um, climate. Okay, let's go ahead and end the poll. And what we see is that uh, most people have said it's the net radiation at the surface. That's correct. So that net radiation at the surface is actually going to cause our surface temperatures to be as they are and also our pressure patterns. Uh, and so that's our major um, ins instigator there. 
So our uh, key points here is that we have a complex and interconnected um, system and it's really important to keep in mind the big picture as you're um, thinking about your local impacts of climate change. Um, and you don't have to do this by yourself. You're not alone in any of this. So our um, Climate Adaptation Science Center or any of the other uh, seven Climate Adaptation Science Centers across the United States um, or your state climate office or there's other regional uh, climate um, centers from USDA or from NOAA. Um, all, all of the people there are there to help, so you don't have to do this alone. Okay. And I'm going to do this uh, short session before we take a break. Um, so all of, all of these things are happening in our atmosphere. And um, so if we think of the, this red line as, for example, surface temperature, um, averaged over the globe. What we see is that just our everyday weather causes some random variability in, um, in that temperature over time. We do have some systems we won't detail today, but you, I'm sure you've heard of El Nino and La Nina. Um, you may have heard of the North Atlantic Oscillation or the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. We have some systems that cycle through um, either in several years or in several decades, and we can um, still see those cycles as they affect the temperature, our global temperature, um, even with the random variability built in. And then, uh, you know, we're going to be focusing on kind of this trend. So even with random variability and these cycles in our system, we can see a long-term trend. And that long-term trend we're going to refer to as, um, uh, if it's in temperature, we'll probably refer to it as global warming. And if it's in other variables, we'll refer to that as climate change. Okay. A common mistake when interpreting statistics is to look at them from too short a distance. This can make everything unclear and confusing. So forget the details and take a step back. You're looking at the dog when you should be concentrating on the owner. As you can see, the dog is all over the place, leaping and bouncing, sometimes upwards, sometimes downwards. But where do you think it'll be in 10 seconds time? Around here, right? But at this moment, the dog is on its way downwards, so why do you think it'll find itself up there? It's because you've noticed the owner. The owner is the trend, and it's he who determines where they both will be in a while as a bit longer than a couple of dog bounds. He could change direction, there's a lot we don't know about this guy, but everything we do know indicates he's heading in that direction. The owner is the long-term trend, the dog is the variation around this trend. Or, the owner is the climate, the dog is a weather. All right, so we're going to be talking about um, that longer term trend um, throughout the next uh, couple days. We have seen long term trends uh, that naturally occur in our climate system, um, but the key is we see that over a very long period of time. We don't, see, so anthropogenic or man-made climate change, we have seen over my lifetime. I have not seen this really long term. I'm not quite that old. Um, so we haven't seen this over our lifetimes. Um, and these are changes in the orbital geometry of the Earth and Sun system. So they tend to happen over tens to hundreds of thousands of years. We also have um, uh, natural climate change uh, focused on, um, you know, the changes in how the sun burns its energy, which happens over like millions and billions of years. Um, it's 2020, so everything's going wrong this year. We probably will see a comet slam into the earth, <laughs> but hopefully not. That would cause some major climate change. Um, 
And then other things that uh, we've seen in our geologic uh, history is just the movement of our continents and where they are on the surface. That's going to affect uh, climate change. We also have seen some natural changes in atmospheric composition. So uh, CO2 values have changed naturally. But again, all of these are over very long term periods of time. So some people have said, well, this climate change is just due to more solar energy coming in. And there was a period of time where there was um, an increase in the radiation leaving the sun's surface, but it's been on a decrease lately. And we've seen um, most of our um, increases in global temperatures um, uh, completely unrelated to this solar radiance. And then if you do the math on it, the, the amount of change that we've seen in terms of our solar radiance, um, either from cycling of sunspot activity, which does cause a, a change in solar um, radiation leaving the sun surface, that um, is relatively insignificant in comparison to the total amount of um, uh, energy that we receive from the sun. So we're only changing it um, a little bit, not enough to significantly change the temperature if you do all the math on it. Um, but we still see this upward trend in temperature. So natural climate change is not causing uh, what, what we're seeing. We have other markers um, for um, for the human-made climate change that I won't go through, but if you're interested in it, there are um, direct markers of um, uh, uh, humans increasing the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We know what the source is. It's pre predominantly from burning fossil fuels. So, um, so the key point here is that um, one weather event isn't a sign of climate change, but a higher frequency of those types of events uh, uh, is, is a sign of climate change. Um, and there are natural drivers of climate change. Uh, they generally occur over thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. That's not what we're gonna focus on today. All right. So, uh, Fourth National Climate Assessment, which was the most recent one, uh, stated that since the third one, which is four years before that, um, we have seen stronger evidence for continuing rapid human-caused warming of the global atmosphere and ocean. And again, emphasizing that it's extremely likely that uh, human influence is the dominant cause. And the key is there's not been any convincing alternative explanation. So all of the things that have been posted in your Twitter and Facebook feeds uh, uh, that climate change isn't really happening, all of those theories that folks have had have been checked out um, throughout the scientific community because what scientist wouldn't want to, you know, have some study that, that um, disprove some big things. So they've looked hard into it and there is no alternative explanation that stacks up um, with the, um, the physics and the data that, uh, that we have. So for an overview of the, um, uh, the climate uh, change in the United States, uh, I highly recommend the U.S. National Climate Assessment. And in particular, for you all, I think you'd be most interested in this volume two, which is on the impacts, risks, and adaptation in the United States. Um, it does have chapters by sector, for example, water resources sector, it does have chapters for regions. So for example, the Southern Plains region or the Southwest um, US, and then it has the more general information. Um, and it's accompanied by other reports if you wanna get into um, specific details. 
Um, the global example of this is um, by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. And again, um, they have something called Working Group 2, and Working Group 2 focuses on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. Um, this will, if you're looking for that kind of more global view of what's going on, um, to, to give some context or maybe to find some other locations around the world that have been doing adaptation, uh, that would be applicable to uh, your region and your needs, then this is the, um, the place to go. And so, um, so as opposed to the Facebook and Twitter posts, except that if they're from, you know, a reputable source like the South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center, which we do have Facebook and Twitter pages that you should um, follow. But um, these uh, two sets of reports are really important because they're done very rigorously and transparently. They're out there for public review. You have to reply to every public comment. Um, and they, use, they don't generate their own research. They summarize all of these scientific papers that have already gone through peer review and have been published in different journals. Um, and most people don't have access to some of those you know, highly specialized journals. And so you can find this summary that, uh, that people have already um, gone through that work for you in these. Um, and in particular, um, there's what's called the summary for policymakers in the IPCC uh, that's uh, much more readable, uh, much more policy relevant, but um, neither of these uh, groups of reports uh, provide any pres prescriptive policy. We Essentially, we don't tell you what to do. We just summarize the science for you in a way that's meaningful. Um, so our next poll So when we refer to climate change in either the IPCC or the National Climate Assessment reports, what are we referring to? I didn't tell you specifically, but you might have gathered it from how I was describing it. Give you a few more seconds to choose your answer there. Okay, we'll close that poll. And we do see that um, most people indicated um, changes in the climate system since the Industrial Revolution began and, the, and a focus on kind of that acceleration in the past few decades. And uh, that's the case. Uh, so number three, for um, those who picked number three, um, that is something that they uh, do talk about, but it's only a portion of what's talked about um, in that report. So it's throughout the entire climate system, not just um, the increases in the radiation. And why does anybody want to summarize these reports? Um, it's a lot of work. It's a ton of work. Um, well, uh, because there's some specific areas that uh, scientists are concerned about. Uh, these are, there's five in particular given by the IPCC, um, which includes um, changing risk in extreme weather events, uh, large scale discontinuities or disruptions, such as with a, uh, we saw that with like 
um, Hurricane Harvey, uh, uh, aggregate impacts and damages. So if these events uh, of, of uh, either extreme precipitation or extreme heat or whatever it might be are happening more often, then you might just get done taking care of the damages from one event and then another event hits you. And so those costs um, aggregate. Um, the uneven distribution of climate change impacts, this might be referred to as climate justice. So um, typically what happens is those who um, uh, cause most of the um, increase in the greenhouse gases are wealthy companies or wealthy individuals and they're hurt the least. It's the people who contribute the least to the problem that are hurt the most. And so that uneven distribution is a major concern. And of course, many of you are um, concerned about risks to unique and threatened uh, systems. This might be an endangered species or it might be um, an entire ecosystem. Um, but those are the concerns. So the IPC has, C has done a qualitative assessment of where we are right now. We have seen um, a one degree Celsius increase um, in the globally average temperature since the pre-industrial period. So we're at this gray line right now. And so what we see is um, distribution of impacts, extreme weather events, and unique and threatened uh, systems have a moderate um, uh, uh, level of, uh, of, of risk. Um, but if we get to one and a half degrees Celsius, uh, of their average globally average temperatures um, above pre-industrial times, we start seeing these um, systems of uh, uh, unique and threatened systems and our extreme weather events getting into the high risk category. And if we hit uh, with the other ones moving into the moderate risk, and then if we hit two degrees Celsius, which is what the Paris Agreement um, targets, then we're in the extremely high risk category and then the high risk for all of them. Um, so we're trying to keep track of what, uh, what the risks are as we um, move forward. Some people ask, well, are we aimed at the two degrees Celsius right now? No, we're nowhere near. Um, even with all the commitments from all the governments around the world, um, we're aiming at three degrees Celsius unless we um, do more mitigation efforts. So these are your two most important sources of information and we'll provide you the slides at the end that have the URLs um, for, um, for these. So stepping back real quickly, um, I talked about the fact that most um, gases will allow that solar radiation to move past. Ozone is an exception. It's absorbed in our ozone layer high above our surface. Um, but the greenhouse gases allow that solar radiation to pass by and warm the Earth's surface. <laughs> and what they do naturally is that they um, when the thermal infrared is released from the Earth's surface, it's absorbed by those gases in the atmosphere, and then it's re-radiated both upward and downward. And that downward then adds to our budget, our, our energy budget at the surface, okay? And this natural greenhouse effect, we wouldn't be alive here. It would be too, too cold on Earth without it. So it's a great thing to have. Um, but on the, on the left is our natural greenhouse effect and on the right is where we are. Um, and we've added more of these greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, um, nitrous oxide, uh, methane, ozone, and others. Um, so more radiation 
uh, more of this thermal infrared that's trying to leave the surface, more of that's absorbed in the atmosphere, that energy then is converted to warmer temperatures, and it also re-radiates both upward and downward, and so we get an additional amount of re-radiated heat entering our Earth's surface that's going to warm our surface temperatures. And so when we talk about the human enhanced or anthropogenic greenhouse effect, um, the right side is what we're talking about. Uh, and this isn't new. If they tweeted back in the old days um, that this would, um, this was known, uh, scientist Eunice uh, Newton Foote um, first determined this in the mid 1800s and others followed her on that. Um, and that's if we have an atmosphere that has higher concentrations of, um, in this case, she was looking at uh, CO2, it would give um, our Earth a higher temperature. So this isn't anything surprising. Okay, so which of the following statements is true? Okay. Give you a couple more seconds on this. All right. So if we go to the results, we see that most people have picked um, Number one, so the globally average surface temperatures can increase at the same time as the amount of incoming solar radiation is decreasing, and that is actually the case. So it's not only true, but that's what's happening um, now. Um, in terms of our national climate assessment, that's the one that offers us more regional details um, than the IPCC, so uh, very good. Okay, so we need the greenhouse gases, we need that greenhouse, that natural greenhouse effect. Um, but if we put too much greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the atmosphere is just going to respond. It's just physics and chemistry. So, um, all right, so have we been putting um, more of these gases in our atmosphere? The answer is yes. So yes, there are still natural sources. They're still in play. Um, Derek goes and burns, you know, all, all the debris that he can find. Um, maybe that's not quite natural, but um, uh, forest fires happen, um, whatever. We still have things that are occurring. Um, but uh, changes in land use, um, uh, predominantly changing to large-scale agriculture, does change our carbon dioxide budget quite a bit. But most importantly, what's happened over the long term is that there's been a natural balance of carbon dioxide um, at the Earth's surface, so exchanging from natural sources releasing to the atmosphere and natural sources like the ocean and the um, vegetation, taking it out of the atmosphere, those have been in balance for thousands and thousands of years. And then we as humans went underground, grabbed carbon reserves, took them to the surface. That part, if that had just been the only thing that happened, we'd be okay. But we burned them. And when you burn fossil fuels, you release carbon dioxide. So it's just chemistry. And so what we've seen over time is that we've had an increasing amount of carbon dioxide, um, especially as different parts of the world have become industrialized. Um, the vegetation and the ocean are trying, they're trying their mightiest to absorb that excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. 
Um, and they've taken about half of that excess carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but that leaves us about half um, in there. And so what we end up getting is um, increasing carbon dioxide, one of our strong greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, we've also seen that bar burning of fossil fuels um, relates to increases in um, methane and nitrous oxide. And so over the long term, these are generally in balance. Yeah, they shifted a little bit. Um, but since the Industrial Revolution, the, the um, amount of these gases in the atmosphere has increased substantially. And um, the, the issue with that is that if, it, if they were just gases and they came out of the atmosphere as we put them in, no big deal. That's what essentially much of the water vapor does put more water vapor into the atmosphere and two weeks later it's going to rain out. So it cycles through the atmosphere pretty regularly. These gases when you put them into the atmosphere they accumulate because their lifetime in the atmosphere is on the tens to hundreds of years. So any excess amount for example of carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere now over half of that will still be in the atmosphere in a hundred years, okay? So this climate change is a long-term thing. We're measuring these increases um, in multiple ways. You might've heard of the Keeling curve. This shows um, uh, changes in carbon dioxide um, over the, um, over the ocean, so in, in Hawaii, um, over the Pacific Ocean. We still see natural cycles, so our natural cycles have not stopped. Um, we might have a really high or really low year, but um, the trend is upward. And we focus primarily on carbon dioxide because um, it's the majority of the problem. Um, and it's going to be in the atmosphere for 100 years. Um, methane will be in the atmosphere maybe for 20 years. So it's, it's still a big problem. And, um, and it can absorb uh, much more energy than a carbon dioxide molecule. But we tend to focus on carbon dioxide because of that. And so we've seen these greenhouse gases increasing um, and they're very long lived. So that's where our big problem is. Okay, so our next poll, as these greenhouse gases absorb um, more of this outgoing infrared radiation, then what would you expect to occur? Okay, a few more seconds on this. All right, very good. So all of the above, yes. Yeah. So you're increasing the temperature near the Earth's surface. So that in itself will cause many of these other um, impacts. And that's what we refer to as climate change. So global warming, when you hear that term, we're just talking about um, increases in the um, uh, globally averaged uh, temperature over time. That's one aspect. Um, but then that causes a lot of other things. Okay, so what does that um, cause? Well, it causes all of these things. And so these should be measurable. So if um, global warming is causing a change in the climate system, we should measure it and be able to measure it in all aspects of the climate system. Okay, and so we use all kinds of techniques to do that from high techy techy um, uh, 
instrumentation that we have nowadays to the low techie techie um, uh, proxy data that we see in our natural uh, world. So we look at those measurements and do we see the signal of climate change? So we see that um, a spring snow cover has been decreasing in extent. Uh, the, the water temperatures in our oceans near the surface are warming and they're warming faster than the water temperatures below. So that makes sense because our atmosphere is warming those upper ocean um, surfaces more. We're seeing sea ice decrease. We're seeing sea level increase, okay, um, from two things. When we melt the glaciers, that water flows into the sea and it fills that bucket more. Um, also, water expands when it warms, and so we have two effects um, that cause uh, sea level change. Um, so this graphic shows the, the black line represents the average of the period from 1880 to 1920 of the temperature, and so anything above that line um, is warmer than that average and anything below that line is cooler than that average. And so what we've been seeing over time is that uh, where we would have about an equal amount of months above that average and below that average, we've seen that um, in the lifetime of our college students um, that they've only seen a few months in their lifetime where uh, the temperature has been below that, um, that average. And we can show this in a number of different ways. We can average it decadally, so that pulls out some of these um, cycles. So we see the um, Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, which has an effect on global temperatures. We see that 40-year cycle here when we average it globally. But overall, we're increasing um, the temperatures in a long-term trend, um, and that trend is accelerating um, in my lifetime. Now, that being said, um, these changes are regional. The impacts are regional for a number of different reasons. So for example, uh, we see cooling trend um, just off the southern coast of uh, Greenland, and that's because all that water uh, uh, from the glaciers, um, all that, you know, that ice is melting, that water's flowing into the ocean, disrupting the current, and it's causing a cooler uh, ocean current there. We see in kind of Oklahoma and East Texas on eastward um, that uh, we've seen little or no change. And in fact, uh, uh, we even see some decreases in temperatures over the last 100 years. And that's because we've had an increase in um, forests over the period of time. So as forests increase, evapotranspiration increases and evapotranspiration is a cooling process. So these things are, are gonna be regional um, in their impact. So whether it's temperature or whether it's precipitation, um, that regional expression of global climate change is um, what you're all interested in and what's really important for us to um, communicate with you. Uh, so again, a few other examples of um, some of the impacts of, of climate change. If we look at the extent of Arctic sea ice, um, when it's at its um, uh, minimum, uh, so basically in September when it's um, warmed the most in the Arctic, we see that that, um, that that area has decreased over time. Again, we have, um, it's different on a year-to-year -year basis. We still have our random variability in our system, but the long-term trend is a decrease in sea ice. 
We also see a decrease in um, glaciers, both in terms of extent, the thickness of the glacier, and the age of the ice. Uh, we uh, see that because carbon dioxide is increasing in the atmosphere, and our oceans are trying to remove that as much as possible. So we see an increase in the carbon dioxide dissolved in our ocean water. And carbon dioxide, when it's dissolved in ocean water, decreases the pH or increases the acidity of that water. And so it's gonna start having impacts on shelled creatures. Um, um, and also uh, coral skeletons. Uh, we know also with coral, in addition to the effect of uh, higher acidity of the ocean, we know that uh, corals can be stressed by high temperature events. These typically occur during El Nino years, but because we, we now have generally warmer temperatures overall, each El Nino that occurs will have an even higher impact on these um, corals. And these lead to bleaching events, which is when the corals are stressed enough that they release that colorful algae um, uh, that's associated uh, with them. And those bleaching events are becoming more common. As I mentioned, we have sea level rise. and um, But again, sea level rise doesn't impact everybody the same. Um, and so the um, uh, poster child in the United States for sea level rise is Louisiana uh, because we not only have sea level rise from climate change, but we also have um, uh, the um, land is subsiding. So we have a double effect. And in Alaska, we're actually getting sea level falls. This is also consistent with climate change because as we remove that mass from the glaciers and that water flows off into the oceans, um, the weight on the land is decreased. And so if you remember back from any geology class that you might have ta taken, um, our continents are on this squishy layer called the asthenosphere. And so when you remove that um, mass off of the top, the land rebounds upwards. And so that's gonna cause sea level falls. Um, so the, even what we're seeing in the Northern latitudes, which are generally sea level uh, falls, um, uh, is consistent with global climate change. Um, and then the last one that I thought I would show you is an example um, from our, um, uh, the phenology of uh, uh, cherry trees. So uh, they've been uh, writing down the date of the um, uh, peak of the cherry blossom season in Kyoto, Japan for hundreds of years. And what we've seen is that um, that date becomes earlier and earlier in the past several decades. And so our um, historical observations are demonstrating that we have what in the climate world we would call rapid. So this is happening on the decadal level. That's very rapid when we talk about climate change. Um, uh, so we've seen these rapid changes. They're all consistent with a warming planet. They're not consistent with long-term natural variations. And the speed with which it's happening is, can be very detrimental to um, uh, water systems, uh, vegetation, wildlife, and others. Um, and so our last question is which of the following statements is false? Okay, a few more seconds on this. All 
All right, we will end the poll there. Good job. So um, it is false that a fall in sea level at a specific location proves that global warming is not occurring. You have to be careful. People will come up with all kinds of very specific examples. You know, this year was colder than last year, so climate change can't be occurring, yada, yada, yada. Um, and you have to re really remember the, um, uh, we're talking on decadal terms, um, not one season. We're talking on um, global impacts, not one specific location. And so uh, thank you for um, listening to this and I'm happy to take any questions in the chat.